Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you all. Go ahead and start tonight's meeting off with our land acknowledgement. Director Perkins is going to read that for us. Thank you. Um, Evergreen Public Schools resides on the traditional lands of the Chinookan peoples and the Cowlitz tribe. They have lived on and cared for this land and its waterways since time immemorial. We thank them for their stewardship and make this acknowledgement to open a space of recognition, inclusion, and respect for all indigenous students, families, and staff in our community. Thank you. Next item is our uh, to adopt our agenda. Entertain motion. I move to adopt tonight's agenda as presented. Second. All those in favor? Aye. Any opposed? Okay. Hey, thank you. Uh, next, is Greg here? Nope. Mr. Kimsey is not here, so then we will go ahead and move on to our next item on our agenda, which is our music presentation, celebrating music in our schools. Go ahead and ask Corinne to come up and to introduce our Mountain View High School Clarinet Choir. What? We weren't really, and we expected to be. She did. <laughs> Sorry, we kind of threw her off. <laughs> Sorry, Karen. Off. Um, honored. To, I, my name's Corinne Ormson, and I'm the Fine and Performing Arts Specialist, and I'm honored to be here tonight celebrating Music in Our Schools Month in, in the month of March. And I'm really excited to bring some of that music from our schools out of the schools to you here tonight. Two weeks ago, they can just have them come in and set up. Um, two weeks ago, these students and many others from across our district participated in the regional competition for instrumental solo and ensemble at the high school level. There are eight districts in our region that all participate in this competition. And there are 59 categories. Of those 59 categories, students from our district won 46. So we're wow. really proud of our showing. So these students are headed to state. They're one of the winners. And their director is going to introduce them and talk a little bit about their preparation and their piece. Well, thank you so much for the invitation to share some music with all of you tonight. My name is Sam Ormson, and I teach at Mountain View High School. This is the Mountain View High School Clarinet Choir. Um, and as uh, Corinne was explaining, this uh, group performed at the Soul and Ensemble event, one of 68 uh, solos or ensembles from Mountain View to perform at the event. And all of the music uh, that was performed there is student-led. Uh, I had nothing to do with their preparation, their music selection, or anything else. This is really a chance for them to practice the skills that I try to teach them uh, as, as far as creating music and rehearsing and creating a community of music making. They pick the music, they set their rehearsal schedule, and that is uh, what you're gonna hear the result of tonight. Uh, they're gonna play part of the uh, Hansel and Gretel Overture for you, and uh, I will turn it over to the Mountain View High School Clarinet Choir.
So sorry, we kind of looked like we were a little stunned, huh? We didn't know if you were continuing on or if you guys were done. Thank you guys so very much. I'm sure that my fellow directors would like to say a few words. Well, I'm guessing that you're all really good in school as well because we know that students who participate in music programs do, do better in school and you guys are a prime example of why we have the programs that we have. Your playing was just exceptional. It was so fun to listen to, and I'm so uh, proud of you um, for all that you've accomplished so far. And I'm very jealous that you can play an instrument because I never took, I never got myself into that, and now I'm mad. So good for you. <laughs> all these years later, huh? <laughs> yes, I'm wishing I had done it. <laughs> well, it was funny. It says I did play the clarinet for a very brief time, but I didn't see it through. And so kind of the same thoughts, right? But I'm curious because I played that type of clarinet. What are these other types? <laughs> oh, there's a different one over there. I was like... <laughs> A little, a little one. <laughs> I didn't even realize that there was a, a different size one on the end there. Yeah. Okay. I, who knew that there were so many different types of clarinets? Learn well, something all the time. <laughs> well, Rob. Okay. Going wrong, he knew. The reason, the reason I know this is that the bass clarinet was my instrument through the 11th grade. Yeah. And then I, then I joined the choir, so I got to do both. <laughs> but you couldn't do both in the same schedule. You know, probably feel that pressure. Thank you. So that was so, it sounded so unified and blended and, and just took me right back to that experience. So do you ever march in with a contrabass clarinet or do you pick a different? <laughs> Rolling around in a wagon. And I, yeah, I still have mine. I haven't played it in 10 years, but the music experience just sticks with you throughout your life. And, and, uh, Thank you. Thank you all for coming in and, and giving us this today. This is always my favorite month for when we have students visit. It's always so much fun to hear the different types of music that our students play and the different things that they get engaged in as it pertains to music. So I appreciate seeing you. I always look forward to it. Good luck at State. Yes. Yeah. Nice job. Thank you. Thank you guys for presenting for us. Okay, actually, well, we get um, <laughs> the instruments picked up because it looks like that's a two-man job. Um, we're going to go ahead and get ready for Greg Kimsey. He has arrived, so we will go ahead and move forward with our swearing in of our new board director. Exactly, it is. <laughs> All right, is where's Jacqueline? So she is. Sorry, the podium, I couldn't see her. She's coming on up. So, Greg Kimsey, uh, we'll go ahead and do your swearing in for you. Okay. Hello, Jacqueline. So, raise your right hand and then uh, repeat after me and use your name after I. So, I, I Jacqueline do solemnly swear. You need the mic, not me. <laughs> Actually, really quick, do you guys mind just scooting over just a little bit so that our audience can see what's going on? Okay. It's being um, filmed via Zoom. If you come just back over, just right in front of the podium would be amazing. Okay. I just want to make sure that everybody gets a chance to see this. We want to be amazing. <laughs> All right, let's do this now. I, I Jacqueline Weatherspoon, do solemnly swear, do solemnly swear, that 
I am a citizen of the United States. That I am a citizen of the United States. And the state of Washington. And the state of Washington. That I will support the Constitution. That I will support the Constitution. And laws. And laws. Of the United States. Of the United States. And the Constitution and laws. And the Constitution and laws. Of the state of Washington. Of the state of Washington. And will to the best of my judgment. And will to the best of my judgment. Skills and ability. Skills and ability. Truly, faithfully. Truly, faithfully. Diligently. Diligently. And impartially. And impartially. Perform the duties of the office of. Perform the duties of the office of. Board of directors in and for. Board of directors in and for. Evergreen School District. Evergreen School District. Clark County, Washington. In Clark County, Washington. As such duties, as such duties are prescribed by law. As such duties are prescribed by law. Well done. Congratulations. Thank you. <laughs> We are so excited to have Jacqueline joining us. Um, she is going to be a very welcome member of this team. We've, I think we've all had a chance to chat with her and, and uh, we're excited to have her and welcome you to join us. Yeah. Nice to see you, Greg. <laughs> Thanks for inviting me. It's an honor. It's great it wasn't very long ago that we were doing that. <laughs> Congratulations. Thank you, Greg. Welcome. Welcome. Sorry, welcome to the team. Welcome. Yes. Welcome. Welcome. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I know that we are all very excited to have her joining our uh, school board. Um, as Victoria said, a lot of us have, or actually all of us have had an opportunity to speak with her and we are excited for what the future holds for us um, with her on our team and to be able to round out um, what we're doing. And she's already so extremely supportive and diligent in a lot of our initiatives, including our equity work that we're already in taking on. And so to have her already, you know, really into that and passionate about the work that we're, we're doing and trying to continue to do, I am, I'm tongue tied, I guess. I, I'm excited um, for what we have for our future. So thank you for applying and willing to join us. And you want to? Well, I'm wondering, do you want to uh, yeah, introduce, just gonna next. introduce the family? Oh, yes, please. Would you like to introduce? We know that this is not just a job that we take on. This is a job that affects us, our families, our children, our spouses. Um, so this is, we want to thank your family as well, of which you mind introducing them. I want to thank my family for coming, my husband, Sultan my daughter Ava, my son Isaiah, and my son Malcolm. Thank you guys. Thank you. Did you have comments? Have you got other family all the way in the back too? Oh, and my uh, mother-in-law, Sophie. <laughs> <laughs> Never forget the mother-in-law. <laughs> oh God. Okay, if there's no other comments from the board, I actually um, would like to go out of kind of character and bring up our um, EAA representative. E -E -E EEA, sorry. I am sorry, Bill. <laughs> There's so many, it's alphabet soup and I have to just like, yeah. <laughs> uh, hi, I'm, I'm Bill Bevel. I'm the president of the uh, certificated educators. We have lots of educators in our system, but I'm president of the certificated educators in the edu Evergreen Education Association. And in anticipation of tonight, there was a motion brought at my last rep council meeting uh, to welcome you to the school board. And uh, <laughs> I just have to say, so my, the equity committee of the Evergreen Education Association uh, wrote this for me to present to you tonight. So letter of support for the appointment of Jacqueline Weatherspoon. On behalf of the Evergreen Education Association, we wish to welcome and express our support for our newest board member, Jacqueline Weatherspoon. We are grateful for Jacqueline's voice and advocacy in the district, including her service on the Parent Teacher Association and the Evergreen Public Schools Equity Advisory Committee. 
as we continue our work within our, within our association to actively promote a culture of equity and inclusion, we look forward to working in partnership with the district around our shared goals of diversity, equity, and inclusion. As Jacqueline begins her term, we are excited for Evergreen Public Schools to have appointed our first black female school board member. We know representation matters. This appointment is truly historic for our district. We want to express our support of the school board's decision in appointing a highly qualified candidate that will bring much needed representation to our district's black community. Welcome to the school board, Jacqueline. Our association sees you and supports you. Okay, and with that, we will move on to our Education Support Professional Week, and I'm gonna go ahead and turn that over to Superintendent Boyd. Thank you, and welcome, Jacqueline. Um, uh, I echo the words of the school board, and just really excited. We have our full team rounded out, so it's exciting for me as well. Um, so it is, uh, next week is Paraprofessionals, uh, Education Support Professionals Week, and um, I think Bill Bevel said it that um, we have a lot of educators. It's not just our teachers. Our teachers are amazing, but all of our paraprofessionals, they're the first person uh, that our students see in the morning riding the bus. The second person they see greeting them from the bus. The third person they see walking by the office and the fourth person they see in the cafeteria. They, what they do matters and they are so important to our uh, community of learners in the Evergreen Public Schools District. So I'm gonna read the proclamation. Uh, whereas education support professionals are involved in nearly every aspect of education, maintaining buildings and grounds, preparing and serving meals, keeping school facilities clean and orderly, assisting in the classroom, providing over 60% of all instructional hours to special education, English language learners, and opportunity gap students, performing and conducting research activities, providing information technology and media services, administrative support functions, and safe transportation, creating a secure and healthy environment, and many other specialized services. And whereas more than 62,000 education support professionals work with and help students in Washington, universities, colleges, and public schools, they're the backbone of our public education system and deserve recognition and thanks for the outstanding work they do for this state and their communities. And whereas educational support professionals are instrumental in fulfilling the state's responsibility to educate all students and by supporting the learning environment, they serve as crucial partners with teachers, parents, administrators, and school boards. Now, therefore, I.J. Inslee, Governor of the State of Washington, do hereby proclaim March 14th through 2022 as Education Support Professionals Week uh, in Washington. And I encourage all people in our state to join me in this special observance. And uh, Lauren Sickles is gonna come back and come up. And um, I think Lauren's here. There he is. And I don't know if you wanna say a couple of words, but we'll, we have a certificate for you. And the office professionals had their meeting tonight, so they weren't able to be here, but that's our other classified group. So Lauren, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Boyd. On behalf, oh, there we go, <laughs> thank you. On behalf of the over 1,500 education support professionals in Evergreen schools that help to keep the doors open, the lights on, the buses rolling, the food being served, the students uh, being supported in their classrooms and all of the innumerable services that we provide to our students and our community. Uh, I appreciate the recognition for the invaluable work that we do. Thank you, Lauren. Thank Thanks, you, Lauren. Lauren. Okay, we next on the agenda is our national board certification recognition. And I'm going to invite building administrators to come up and introduce their Nord, sorry, national board certified teachers. I think I need to turn it over to Julie. <laughs> no, Julie, because I keep fumbling my words. Now, Heather. <laughs> Good evening and welcome, Mrs. Weatherspoon. I'm glad you're here. Okay. 
So uh, speaking from personal experience, I can tell you that teachers who pursue their national boards commit to examining their practice and demonstrating its positive effect on student learning. They do this by collecting evidence and um, showing their proficiency in five areas, and those are knowledge of students, content knowledge, use of data and assessments, and pedagogy. And it is no easy task to complete your national boards, let alone to actually earn them. So you don't become nationally board certified just because you finish. Um, and these uh, teachers here are truly exceptional examples of our profession and what we have to offer our students. And I am so thrilled that they are here to join with us tonight in um, acknowledging them. Uh, good evening, school board. Thanks for having us. Uh, thank you, Superintendent Boyd. And as Heather said, it's an honor for us to be here to in turn honor um, some of our newly nationally board certified teachers. Um, many folks probably know that in Evergreen Public Schools, we are blessed uh, each year with a number of excellent folks that join those ranks. And we also know how much that means in terms of dedication and perseverance in order to do this. It's a very rigorous program to go through. And folks, we couldn't be prouder of all of you. And um, we're just very excited uh, that we have some more folks um, joining those ranks again, as I said. Um, this year we had seven newly um, named nationally board certified teachers. I know that not all of them could be here tonight, but we're blessed with uh, some of them and with some of our administrators as well. And so um, starting with Mrs. Hayworth here, I'll just welcome her up to the microphone to say a few words and introduce. Thanks, Jen. You know what happens when I get the microphone. Yes, I do. That's <laughs> we love it when you get the microphone. <laughs> Thank you uh, for this opportunity to present. Carolyn Kava, please come up. Carolyn has been in our dual. Carolyn has served in our dual language program for the last six years, and she brings an energy and a love and a passion and passion for all students. We know that some people can pass a test and write papers and make a program okay and rock it, but she lives it and breathes it. So we are very proud of you. Good Thank job. You so much. Are we allowed to hug? Hi, I'm Jamie Johnston. I'm the principal at Covington Middle School, and I, it is my pleasure to be able to introduce to you our newcomers teacher. She has been here with us for 15 years. She has done a tremendous job. She loves our kids, and she has just fits completely into our program at Covington. This is Victoria Bond, and we want to congratulate her on becoming nationally cer certificated. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> Well, I would like to take this time to introduce Janelle Robertson. Um, Janelle is a fourth grade teacher at Orchards Elementary School. And when we talk about being student centered and an advocate for your students, uh, Janelle embodies that every day. And she is always working to strive and do the best she can and really make sure that all of our students are seen and welcome in the classroom. So I'm so proud of you, Janelle, you are amazing. Hello, I'm Tracy Schuster, the principal at Hearthwood, and this is Kathleen Rada, our newest certified, National Board Certified Teacher at Hearthwood. She teaches fifth grade and just is um, just so passionate and amazing advocate for her children, which Emily just shared as well, but just so passionate for the work she does for our children every day, and I appreciate you, and it's well, well deserved. Hey, Scott, I have a question. Mr. Monroe? <laughs> do, sorry to grab you like that. Do you, do you happen to know off the top of your head how many nationally board certified teachers we have in our system now? I wish I did, but I do not. Okay. I just was wondering. I know we have quite a few. We do have quite a few. I know that um, the last time that we were fortunate enough pre-pandemic to go from school to school to do some presentations to our folks. I know that we had um, more nationally board certified teachers than any other district in our area, something that we're very proud of. I'm sorry that I don't know the number, but I'll find out. 
No, that's okay. Thank you. you Thank you, and congratulations to everyone. Thank you. Congratulations. Okay. Next on our agenda is the board consent agenda. I'm going to ask for a motion. I move adoption of the board consent agenda as presented. Second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Okay, and then we're on to the superintendent's consent agenda. I move to approve the superintendent consent agenda as presented. Second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Okay. Next item is matters reserved for the board, uh, the legal service agreement, Washington State School Vaping Litigation. I'm going to go ahead and turn this over to Superintendent Boyd for a short summary. Yeah, it's no surprise to everybody that uh, vaping is a big issue in our schools and everywhere. And we are joining with um, a conglomeration of schools to uh, put a suit against the uh, vaping companies to be able to um, uh, uh, get some compensation to support our students to uh, to not vape. So that's the the matter. Okay. So, John, I just want to confirm for the audience that this does not cost the district anything to participate in this legal action, does it? Correct. It doesn't cost us anything. Um, if we uh, win, we'll be awarded money to be able to support for uh, uh, prevention and intervention with uh, tobacco and substance abuse. It was interesting when we got the information on this and I was reading up on it. Um, I knew it wasn't that good for kids. I mean, it's obviously not good for kids, but it really isn't good for kids. And it was much more dramatic than I, I realized. So I think this is a really great. It, it's a significant health issue for young people today. <clears throat> okay, and this actually is board action. So I need to entertain a motion. I move that we uh, enter into the legal services agreement for the Washington State School Vaping litigation. Second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? <laughs> All right. Moving on. Superintendent's report. Yes. And uh, I just want to uh, give a kind of an update on my uh, transition plan. One of the things I'm doing is I'm going us and asking uh, folks um, questions and what's going well, what are some challenges and what advice do you have for me? And I think I've said this before, but I think I've probably talked to 60 people and I'll bet 55 of them, the first or second thing out of their mouths is there are some really great people in the Evergreen Public Schools. It, it's uncanny. And today, uh, actually yesterday and this week, we added two more. We get to keep one. Craig Birnbach, I want to just say, is our new Executive Director of Communications. And Craig participated in a very rigorous process. Um, and there were uh, about 11 candidates um, down to four. He interviewed and did just an exceptional, jo exceptional job of winning uh, and uh, being. So we appointed him and are selecting him for our uh, executive director of Com communications and I want to congratulate Craig publicly. And I'm going to uh, introduce Dr. Miner, our newest addition here in just a moment. And the next topic when we do our teaching and learning update, I'm going to call her up. Uh, but that's a second uh, excellent person that we've added to our ranks here that you'll learn about in just a moment. I do want to uh, thank Victoria for serving on that committee um, and participating uh, on the selection of our executive director. I do want to let folks know that we're going out and doing, uh, beginning to um, rebrand our communications related to the levy. Uh, we're going back out on the ballot on the 26th. And so we have, um, we're putting forward an, a whole uh, different set of uh, things. We're putting our levy flyer together, rebranding it, and some other activities that we'll be sharing with you. Um, and then also, we're going to do a thought exchange. And a thought exchange is a, an interactive way to have a dialogue with your community. Uh, I want to thank Rob Perkins for helping us kind of think through that and, and actually uh, bring forward the idea that we would uh, interact with our community and ask them just a simple question, what can we learn from this levy failure? So we want to uh, talk to and learn from our community to help us uh, improve and do better in the future. So that's uh, coming up, and we'll be launching that thought exchange probably later this week. We're working on the details of that. 
Uh, we're in the middle of budget and staffing, and we are planning for two different scenarios. We are, uh, we've uh, lost about um, 4,000 students in the last five years, uh, from uh, a high of 26,000 to now about 22,000. Um, and in the last two years, we've lost about 2,000. So our staffing, we've been overstaffed, so we're kind of right-sizing our staffing. We've been working with our admin to do that and uh, bring our staffing back into contractual levels. We feel like we'll be able to do that without RIF. Uh, we're hopeful that we can do that with attrition. We've had a lot of retirements, and we're working on a plan to do that. Given the size of our district, we're also working on a plan, kind of a hypothetical scenario, and I say hypothetical because if the levy passes, then we won't have to execute it, but the levy fails, then we'll have to execute more, shall I say, draconian measures to cut um, at, a, at a much deeper level. So we, it, given the size of our district, we can't wait till eight, uh, April 26th to plan that. So we met with the cabinet team today, and we're also going to be working with a, a, a group of uh, cabinet folks, district leaders and principals to kind of plan and think through those scenarios in line with our values and our new strategic plan and uh, our equity lens as well. So uh, in the Friday report, you'll have uh, information about how I'm framing that up and how we're working together to do that and a timeline for bringing that to the board and having you weigh in on it as well. So I just wanted to bring that to your attention. Uh, there's uh, Monday's uh, new day in public schools where the masks are, are coming off. The governor did lift the mask requirement as of uh, the last day is Friday. So I think the majority of people are really excited about that and happy to uh, get to that point in this, in this uh, journey. Um, there is a subset of folks that are really worried and nervous about it that we're going to have to come side by side and support just like we've supported people that were upset and not happy about wearing their masks. So. Our principals uh, will be doing some messaging. The new guidance came out today. We'll get some message out, messaging out tomorrow related to that new guidance that uh, is, has been ever-changing during the pandemic. So I wanted to report on that. Um, I want to just thank um, uh, Ginny and Julie that we're meeting as board leaders, uh, leadership every month. We're um, just for Jacqueline and everybody's uh, benefit. And we're sharing those notes as the Friday report so all the board members are always in the know of what we're doing. And so I want to thank you for taking the time and spending that with us. And uh, in that conversation, we did talk about a facilitator to be able to support us. We, um, the board wanted to wait until uh, Jacqueline was aboard to do some uh, team building. So I'm working with a, an individual that I've identified. I've shared that in the last board report, and I'll share it again, the proposal to do that. Um, it, what, it would, the way it would work is we'd be working both with the cabinet team and the board leadership team in two different things. Um, I think Julie and Jenny's idea was then we might bring both the cabinet and board together and do kind of compare notes and talk about how we want to work together as well. So I really appreciate it. I thought that was an excellent idea. I think the cabinet would appreciate the opportunity to be with the board and the board would appreciate the opportunity to connect with the cabinet on that level too. So excited about that. And just, again, just to reiterate, welcome to uh, Jacqueline. Had an opportunity to sit down with her. Very excited uh, to work with you and looking forward to the journey as well. So I wanted to just officially thank you and, and welcome you. And I want to thank you, John, for your weekly updates because I think it's uh, great keeping us all in communication with what's happening. Great. You're welcome. It's my pleasure. I'll just you want me to go right into the next. Where's I'll just go right into the next one. So, you know, I mentioned that there are a lot of good people in the Evergreen School District. We added uh, um, an excellent uh, person, an excellent educator, longtime educator, Dr. Rebecca Miner. If, and if Rebecca, if you could come up, uh, we've asked her to say a few words. Um, and I'm going to let her talk. I'm not going to steal any thunder, but. Um, she is, uh, I'm just over the moon excited about having her to support us uh, with our work here. Uh, she's the new assistant superintendent of teaching and learning, and I'll let her take it from here. Welcome, uh, Rebecca. Thank you so much, uh, Superintendent Boyd, members of the board. It's just exciting to be here tonight. I didn't bring much thunder, but nonetheless, <laughs> I'm excited to um, have the chance to just tell you how grateful I am and how excited I am to be supporting the work in Evergreen. Um, as you indicated, um, President Gronwald, 
Uh, it is a, a team effort when you're a person who's passionate about public education. So I would like to take a moment of personal privilege and introduce my husband, Timothy Buckley, who's joined me tonight. Uh, Timothy and I have deep roots in this community. Um, and before we left about 10 years ago for me to pursue my first and second superintendencies in the state of Washington, um, we lived here for many years. And in fact, um, I, we live in my childhood home on the west side of Vancouver. So, and Timothy, little known fact, uh, was the architect on a now demolished remodel of Mill Plain Elementary School. <laughs> so he's had the chance in his professional ter career to interact with Evergreen as well. But as I said, I'm just very grateful that I can be here to support the work of the district um, for a time. And I hope that um, we'll have a chance to interact as um, I work through some things here with you. Welcome. Welcome. Thank you. Yes, welcome and uh, thank you for joining us. And I look forward to getting to know you better. So thank I'm, I'm sorry I didn't, wasn't aware you were in the audience or I would have introduced myself before the meeting started. Okay, oh, do we have a teaching and learning update no, from Clarissa? Yeah. Okay, update, all right, then we will go in. I'm sorry, I just turned my computer off. Okay, I'm fired. Yes, I just was trying to get back there. So we're gonna go into our equity and inclusion update. And if I can go ahead and get the executive director in equity and inclusion, Clarissa Hightower up for our update. Thank you, Clarissa. Thanks for having me. Let me get this down, there we go. My little vertically challenged self. Okay, so what you're gonna hear today, the theme is development, support. Um, so as you all um, mentioned earlier, our wonderful para professionals are a vital part of our system. And we also wanna make sure they have the opportunity to have professional development on equity. So next week is gonna be the second installment um, for our professional, our para professionals to have the opportunity to um, have some equity professional development. Our specialists are gonna be facilitating that for them. Um, and there have been, we got very good feedback on the first session. This is the first of four. Um, and so, excuse me, this is the second of four, I apologize. Um, and that will be happening on next week. We also have our, um, we also had our district equity leadership team meeting or, or uh, professional development as well. Um, and so that is the opportunity for all of our department level leaders as well as our board members it's for us to learn and grow together um, in our efforts with equity. Um, and we have those just about every other month. Um, and so it gives us time to apply our learning in spaces. And I always enjoy um, being able to do that with you all. Our specialists are in buildings continuously, um, partnering with our administrators, um, as well as any other members of the admin team to support their um, school improvement plan goals, as well as supporting um, their equity teams. And so that is something that began at the beginning of the year for sure, but as we are nearing those um, school improvement plan presentations, our specialists are out making sure um, that our admin teams um, are supported in that and making sure that um, they're ready for you all when, that's, when that time comes. Um, elementary principals um, receive a mini equity PD at the end of each month. Um, our last mini session was around the idea of dignity and how to treat folks with dignity, even in tough conversations. Um, so provided them some resources for doing that. We also kicked off our celebration of disability awareness and Women's History Month. So provided resources to schools to be able to um, join in celebration with that. And we also um, took a moment to make sure that our community uh, at, at large, meaning our, our staff, excuse me, was very aware of what our Eastern European community is experiencing at this time and to keep that in mind um, as our students are entering our buildings, knowing that they may have um, family that is experiencing crisis afar and how to make sure that they feel supported in their academic as well as social and emotional learning and during these times. So we sent resources as well as an acknowledgement that that is taking place. Finally, this month's Equity Advisory Committee meeting, we'll have Sue Steinbrenner join us and she will be um, soliciting the input of our members 
Um, she wants multiple perspectives on how to make our facilities a more, uh, more inclusive and welcoming places for all of our community members. So she'll be joining us to pick our brains about that. And that is the equity and inclusion update for this month. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you, Clarissa. Absolutely. Okay, I'm going to go into comments by the school board. Um, I guess I can start us off. Um, I would say my biggest work has been outside of the district doing other things, but um, also being involved with the with the strategic planning process. So we had our training on our for our meetings. So when we go out for public input, um, we'll be there and ready to facilitate those meetings. And I'm so excited to hear what people have to say. Um, and I appreciate all of you on the board signing up for the different uh, meetings um, so that we can all have listening. So Julie and I will be part of the facilitation piece, but I know all of us are very interested in hearing what people have to say. Yeah, I'm excited for that too. Um, I know that uh, Victoria both and I signed up for ones that are gonna be done at the school um, after hours where we did like some of the feeder schools. And then we're also gonna do with the business community. So, that, I mean, the group that we've worked with has done a really good job facilitating and getting us to where we're at. And so now we can go out and ask um, for community input. Do you have anything, Rob? I know most of what I have is legislative, so I'll cover it at the time. Okay. Uh, yeah. Um, it's been a, I mean, besides, well, I guess it hasn't been a slow two weeks with Delt, and there's been a lot of things, but most of it has been covered. Um, it's been a productive two weeks with our strategic plan and our levy work and our appointment of Jacqueline to the board. So I'm ready for a breather. <laughs> with that, okay, any future agenda? I, actually, I'm sorry, Jacqueline, would you like to speak at this point or are you, you, you do not have to, please do not feel obligated. <laughs> I would like to say that I am honored um, for this opportunity to be here and I'm looking forward to doing the work. Um, the levy is very important and I'm really looking forward to talking to the community about that and being a part of that. Thank you. Okay. <clears throat> Any future agenda items? We've got loads on our plate. <laughs> <laughs> that was a thank you from the superintendent if nobody heard that. Okay, next on the agenda is our citizens' comments. Um, any citizen wishing to address the board about an item not on, that, on the meeting's agenda may do so during this designated time. As long as the comments are not personnel related or about an individual employee or student and are not legal in nature. Each speaker will be allowed three minutes to address the board. Comments are to be directed at the board as a whole and may not be addressed to any individual member of the board, the administrative staff, or the audience. With that, we'll go ahead and call the first person on the list. How many do we have online? Do we have any on Zoom? None? Okay, perfect. Uh, first signed up is Mark Gassaway. This is the first uh, opportunity I've had to address the school board. So I first want to start off with, um, I believe in education. I believe education is the means to raise people out of poverty, to end discrimination, to bring peace to the world, and to help individuals to make better informed decisions. Today I'm here to help educate taxpayers about the upcoming April 26 special levy request so they can make better informed decisions. A few weeks ago, the Evergreen School District voters rejected a proposed educational programs and operations levy, which if approved, would have resulted in historic 
20% increases in revenue compounded annually for the next three years. Thankfully, voters were paying attention. In response, on February 15th, you approved placing a new levy of $1.70 per assessed thousand for the years 2023, 2024, 2025 on the April 26th, 22 ballot. It was communicated this was, is a replacement levy. What you did not say is that this levy will not only replace existing EPO revenue, but will add millions of dollars in new revenue through increased property taxes. This school board fails to acknowledge that revenue granted by this levy is a product of assessed property values. Over the last five years, assessed property values in the Evergreen School District have increased on average more than 10% annually. It's simple math that the same levy rate multiplied by greater assessed value equals increased revenue. Let's look at the new proposal. And I provided copies of this graph for the school board members, so you'll have a copy of it. <clears throat> Based on information provided by the election filing, if this levy passes in 2023, the EPO revenues will increase by $5.8 million, or 15.7%. In 2024, an additional increase of $2.6 million, and in 2025, an increase of $2.3 million. In three years, the school district will receive $25 million in new revenue for EPO programs. And by 2025, the annual EPO revenue will increase $10.7 million, or 28.9%. School officials like to lament the consequences if the levy doesn't pass. What you fail to inform taxpayers is why this tax increase is necessary. What will the additional $25 million be used for? You have stated that even with the additional revenue, tough decisions will still need to be made. Please help me understand. With a 28.9% revenue increase, how tough can those decisions really be? Please stop patronizing taxpayers by messaging this tax increase as replacement levy. You are asking for replacement funding plus millions more and trying to obfuscate the increase by rolling the EPO levy together with the debt service and technology levies is disingenuous. Be transparent. I believe most taxpayers would support a reasonable request for funding the EPO programs. For example, a levy rate of $1.55 assessed per thousand would provide sufficient revenue over the next three years for a more reasonable 5, per, 5, per, 5 to 6% annual increase. Please tell me how much is enough. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Gasway. <laughs> next on the list is Phil Cro I'm sorry, I'm not sure the spelling on that. Welcome. <laughs> I murder it. <laughs> my name, old name. I'm Mr. Phil Cronovich. I'm actually a stakeholder. My children have graduated from Evergreen School District. I am in the district. Uh, my first question is, I, I just spoke with Rob just uh, previous to the meeting here, just for a moment, it, it, involving a clothing issue. Um, and I understand there's some issues with discussing specific people. And so I won't get into that. So I guess really the question is to all the board members, how do I go about uh, dealing with the issue? Um, it's quite serious, so uh, how do I go about that with, without, you know, it, it's very, very touch and go, it, it, yeah, and uh, so how do I go about that properly without? So I, I do have to apologize because we are actually not allowed to engage um, during this time, but I welcome you to not. email all of us. Okay. If you want direct no, that, that communication was, that was, with that us. Was, that's fine. That, that, we'll do that. That's okay. a better way to go because I understand there's, there's some things here involved that would be very, very, okay. Uh, just real quickly, the levy fail. Just my general input is, yeah, the community uh, is not happy about it. Um, the community input concept is, I think, a good one. That's really what needs to happen to rework that. And I, 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 I applaud you for that. Go that direction. Let's get that conversation going and give you an open chance to, to come back to you. I think the community should do that. I, but you know, get that negotiation channel going. Um, there's a diversity training coming up, I guess, on August 26th, I see on the calendar. Um, I think you're losing parents on that. I, I think that 
that's just not everybody's responsibility. You're not responsibility. This public school district is not to teach values. That's a parent's job. And I think that's a lot of what comes from the parents. They, they, they want you to teach reading, writing, arithmetic, and those things. And I think that's what you should do. Uh, really quickly, with one minute to go, uh, appreciate the vaping policy. You know, standing up for that's great. You, you know, I know you're all parents. I, I know you get it. Um, but somebody probably ought to, does somebody talk to the governor when you see this man and say, you made, you signed a law, marijuana law, that legalizes marijuana in our state, and, and you want to talk about vaping? And, you know, I know, I know you are involved with children, but, I mean, doesn't somebody talk to legislators and say, you know what, you need to be the example as legislators? You passed laws that legalize illegal drugs, drugs that hurt children? I mean, what does that say? You know, I just, I hope the school board talks to those legislators. I know you're involved with them. Or should be. You should tell the governor, what are you doing? Thank you. Thanks. Thanks for your input. And I will email you, and I'll kind of let you know my Thank issue. You. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Okay. Next on the list is Crystal Bolt. Good evening. Thank you. Never before in history of Washington State has your job been so difficult. I extend my gratitude for your service. Since the National School Board Association has attempted to weaponize the FBI against concerned parents, I'm unfortunately compelled to state this disclaimer. This letter and the enclosed documents are in no way meant to cause you to feel threatened in any way. I hope that you see these documents as an opportunity to receive support. The enclosed public disclosure requests have been served to all directors of the Evergreen Public School District, every school district in Clark County, and many more districts across the state, including the Seattle School District and other King County, have been or will be served the same documents. To ensure that this is, effort is recognized as a demonstration of support, the Clark County Sheriff has also been given a copy of the documents and informed of our peaceful intent. We recognize that there is a fundamental conflict of interest between school government and parents. School government has a vested interest in the system as a whole, while parents have a vested interest in the children. We have identified that the source of this conflict may stem from the fact that our local school boards have been forced to give away increasingly more decision-making authority to the Washington State School Directors Association, the WASDA group, and other state agencies. The Superintendent of Public Instruction, Chris Rydell, has clearly threatened to withhold taxpayer funds that rightfully belong to our school district based on whether or not we comply with health policies we may or may not agree with. Nowhere in the revised Code of Washington is power granted to Mr. Rydell or the Office of the Superintendent of Public Instruction to withhold or bribe with the funds they are tasked to dispense to the local districts. Is it possible that if Mr. Rydell indicates or acts on the threat of withholding funds, this would imply extortion on his part? Thank you. Thank you for your comments. Angela, is it Daniels? Superintendent, members of the board, my name is Angela Daniels. This is my battle buddy, Riverly. We the people founded this country with a structure that was designed to keep the greatest authority at the local level of government. Yet our governor and state agencies have made unilateral decisions for the whole population while ignoring the voices of, the lo of local school boards and parents. Perhaps we lost sight of that original vision of strong local authority when we let the state and federal agencies like WSSDA, OSPI, and the National School Board Association, NSBA, gain enough control to withhold our state funding over matters that should be a personal medical choice for every citizen. A child's right to an in-person public school education being held contingent upon wearing a mask was, is, and will always be unacceptable and reprehensible. No parent or caregiver should ever be tasked with the arduous directive to allow the school district, Washington Department of Health, 
and third parties to gain access to private protected medical information and educational information of their child and consent to a non-elective compulsory COVID-19 test in order to return to school or participate in any extracurricular school activities. All of us share the responsibility of getting ourselves into the dangerous predicament of a few people dictating to the masses. We also share the responsibility of getting ourselves out of this predicament. There is a solution and a path forward. The documents enclosed are our first act of helping you, our local school board, take back your rightfully authority to determine how best to represent the parents of the district. Please use these public disclosure requests as an opportunity to educate yourself and us so we can better understand an entanglement we find ourselves in with the OSPI, WSSDA, and other state agencies who are overstepping their lawful boundaries. According to RCW 28A345020, all Washington State school boards are required to be members of the WSSDA. Most other states do not have laws that compel membership. Their school boards still have the authority to choose whether or not they want to take guidance from various state agencies, but not here in Washington. In RCW 28A343100, school board members are again compelled by law starting in 2022 to take governance training in cultural competency, diversity, equity, and inclusion standards. Those words are referring to critical race theory, sexual education for children as young as five years of age, and curriculums that promote transgenderism. Thank you. Thank you for your comments. Is it Jim Judkins? Unfortunately, we do have to have you keep it on. Sorry. Hmm. Almost you done. You may not understand me very well because I, I talk quietly. Okay, whatever. Actually, you know what, sir? You're far enough away from everybody. Go ahead and take it down. Okay, thank you. These are just two examples of how our state legislature has taken away your authority to choose what you're taught and what you will be compelled to promote to our children. Representative Joel McIntyre, or Joel McIntyre attempted to introduce a bill in the current legislature session that proposed that local school board members in the WSSDA be optional rather than mandatory. Making a membership optional would return decision-making authority back to the local level and send a clear message to WSSDA that we are erroneously, erroneously let power, let power become too centralized. WSSDA has been treating Washington students and parents as if they belong to one large district rather than respecting the authority of 295 elected school boards in this state. Unfortunately, Joel McIntyre was just recently strong-armed into dropping this bill under the pressure from the WSSDA and politicians who do not have parents' best interests in mind. <coughs> we, the parents of Washington, finally comprehend how little authority you have left to represent us. It is time to come together to restore your authority and ours. In addition, in addition to providing information requested at these document, in these documents, we ask that the Evergreen Public School Board does all of the following. Number one, reach out to the representative, Joel McIntyre, to give him your support of the bill proposed by, <clears throat> that proposed WSSDA membership to be optional. <clears throat> Whether it's this year or next year, that bill must be passed for the future of our children. Strongly urge, number two, strongly urge WSSDA to withdraw membership from the NSBA uh, Currently, almost 20 other states have left the SN, NSBA, and Washington parents are very disappointed to see WSSDA's silence on the matter. Pass, number three, pass a resolution acknowledging and affirming that parents are the primary stakeholders in their children's future. Several other districts in Washington have passed this resolution. Number four, Cease any practice of sharing our children's health information 
with third parties, including state agencies. Number five, disband tests to return. I assume that's COVID testing to get negative, to get into the district, right? Okay. Uh, for children to return to school or participate in any extracurricular school activities. Okay, uh, now we've got 37 seconds. I appreciate you listening to what I had to say and hopefully you take what's written on that document that each one of you have into consideration before we go forward, okay? Thank you. Thank you, appreciate your comments. At this time, I do want to remind everybody in the audience that they are required to wear a mask at all times. That covers your nose and your mouth. If you are not able to do so, I will need to ask you to leave the premises. Next on the list is Gary Wilson. Thank you. Is it okay to take this down? Thanks. Um, this is part four of four. You, four of you plus the superintendent have gotten this letter and some public disclosure requests, and so this is partly for Jacqueline. <laughs> Welcome. <laughs> um, as we finish the 2021-22 school year, we envision and hope for a harmonious partnership between parents, school district leadership, and legislators to restore the freedom of personal choice over what our teachers and students wear on their faces and put in their bodies as well as restore authority to the local level of government. However, if these freedoms are ignored by the Evergreen Public School District School Board, we may be compelled to take our children out of the public school system by the fall of 2022. As you are well aware, over 55,000 children have been withdrawn from the Washington State Public School System over the past year, and that number will likely more than triple if testing mandates are upheld and a COVID vaccine is made a requirement of attendance. I believe uh, Superintendent Boyd mentioned you've lost 4,000 in the last four years, 2,000 in the last two years, it sounded. Um, yeah, so this just kind of echoes that. Uh, this next paragraph is more talking about the state across the state, but it says here, as a body of parents across Washington State, we have heard your collective plea for cooperation and help. You've been sincerely telling us your hands are tied by WASDA and OSPI. We understand you now, so together, let's unite our hands and restore your authority to represent us, the parents of the Evergreen Public School District. I had a little more course to say, so <laughs> um, just candidly, um, if you're an establishment school board member believing the state is the primary stakeholder and you are comfortable being basically their puppet dancing on their strings, then you may not be in favor of these PDR's public disclosure requests identifying among other things, the law, and in particular, where our more and more state-run school system has transgressed those laws. If, however, and this is my and our hope, you are a school board member who believes in more local school board authority and control, and you believe the parents are the primary stakeholder of the children you are tasked with overseeing the education of, then you will welcome our PDR public disclosure request. Thank you, your Evergreen School District's Washington Parents Alliance. And I do have some documents. There's been six more people that have signed um, the public disclosure request. And of course, Jacqueline hasn't received any yet. So where would I leave those? You. Thank you. Thank you for your comments. Next on the list is Sean Bergman. Thank you, board members. That's my first time being here. Welcome. Um, I appreciate the privilege. Anyway, I just wanted to say that uh, I care about my community and the schools and want the best for our children because it's really important. You know, I'm a parent of two children. Uh, I have one graduating out of uh, one of the high schools, and then I have a son that had to take a GED because of the circumstances of not being too interested in school, unfortunately. But this is what I was frustrated with, and I'm not trying to be negative, but uh, I've seen some the, uh, the school rankings, and it's not being very good for the Evergreen District. Uh, 
scorecard uh, for the uh, Evergreen High School. This is actually from US News and World Report and it's current information that uh, mathematics proficiency is only 24% of the Evergreen High School. And I have a concern for that as a parent and for our community because math is really important you know, for every child. And then um, the other school, uh, Henrietta Lacks, is 33% in the proficiency. And my concern is, is there any way that we can uh, try to better our children, to give them uh, tutors, or to try to use the budget a little more efficiently to help our kids, or maybe have a summer school program or something to better our children also in the educational situation that we're having. Because to me, if a child cannot do math or read and write, it's a very bad problem. And then they're not gonna be able to probably do very well in their entrance exams for college or for their future uh, careers. And I know that uh, you, we, we can only do so much as parents, but sometimes from what my experience with my children are that three quarters of the teachers did a very good job and the other percent didn't do a very good job or they didn't show an interest in their students. And so my children, were, they sort of dropped off from being interested in some just, you know, classes and some curriculum. So I don't know if there's anything we can do to improve that. And then the other thing is too that I agreed with these other, some of these other individuals that as a district, I think we need to be independent from what the state mandates. And we need to also go by what the community wants to do or have for our children. And that's my opinion on that. And then the other thing is too that uh, um, I don't believe children should be doing, having masks on when they're doing hard exercise and athletics. I think that's really hard for oxygen deprivation where they do not be able to breathe properly. Anyway, I see my time's up, but I did want to give my two cents in. Would you board members like to see these figures? I can give those to you. Okay, thank you. Thank you for your comments. Okay, at this time, we are gonna go ahead and, actually it's 6.39 at this time, we're gonna go ahead and go into recess to sign some documents and we will reconvene for our workshop uh, presentation from Instructional Materials Committee followed by a legislative update, update by Director Perkins. Thank you all for coming. All right, we're gonna go ahead and bring our meeting back to order. Um, and while we finish our meal, we're gonna go ahead and get our instructional com materials committee workshop. We're gonna get a presentation on our math adoption and our English language arts adoption. Come on up, thank you. Good evening. My name's uh, Mike Espinoza, and I'm apparently too short for this podium, or too tall for this podium. Um, <laughs> Marlene is going to go second because she's got cool videos of kids, so I thought I'd, I'd be the warm-up act. Um, so I recently shepherded uh, some English teachers. Thank you. <laughs> I just turned 50 and my back's not what it used to be. I appreciate that. <laughs> Damn. Um, so I, I uh, led a review and adoption team effort in the realm of high school English language arts. And uh, you'll see, uh, you have before you a, a one-pager that kind of highlight some bullet points of that process and some of the thinking and rationale behind what we're hoping to do. Um, uh, four years ago, we did have an adoption for high school English language arts. And really our goal at High School English is to provide some flexible modular resources for our teachers in terms of the content, the types of text, literary and nonfiction texts they can put in front of kids. And as we've entered into uh, our really important equity work, um, we decided to go through a review process to really take a look at, is what we're putting in front of kids, um, is, is it in alignment with our DEI work? Is it really what we want for our high school English classrooms? Do our kids, I think it's really important, um, it's a really important value amongst English teachers to ensure that the kids, their students, see themselves reflected in the literature and the nonfiction text that they interact with and are thinking about and talking about and working with and writing about. So. That was a big lens for us in terms of the review work that we did. And so um, 
where we are with this is we have a supplemental resource currently called Actively Learn. It's an online platform which gives access to thousands of texts in terms of novels, literature, uh, nonfiction articles. It's updated fairly regularly, and the teachers tend to use that um, in, uh, infinitely more than our currently adopted resource, which kind of is the equivalent of, the, of a textbook that's put online. And so as we move away from that big box publisher um, online equivalent of the giant textbook full of kind of traditional text to more robust uh, inclusive content, I think the teachers really s are really um, drawn, drawn towards the Active Learn uh, platform which provides for that. So I know that we'll have a, a series of meetings where you have an, have an opportunity to look at some of the resources that we bring before you and ask some questions. So th this document really is designed to highlight um, the need for the materials, the rationale behind them. You'll see where it says platform access. There are two links there that um, when you have some free time, I'm sure you'll be able to click into there and I can show you what were some of the uh, criteria that we use on the teams to decide that Actively Learn was a resource that we wanted to elevate to adopted status, not just supplemental. So I'm not gonna go through all of this. You'll have time to do that, I'm sure, on your own, but just wanted to highlight a couple things. Um, there is a video that sort of showcases the platform and what it's designed to do with some examples. You have in this middle box some um, credentials that you can log in and basically see everything that the, the platform has to provide. Um, the way that this document is laid out is that we uh, had specific review criteria that we used. Uh, there was a team of teachers involved. It's part of our, our, our policy around adopted materials and instructional materials committee. We had teachers from each of our high schools uh, involved in this process through the both the review process where we looked at usage data of our current platform uh, for content as well as actively learn. We collected feedback from all of our high school English teachers and administrators uh, last spring and got some real point of need uh, clarity around what they want and what they're hoping for in terms of a resource in alignment with our work in equity and uh, alignment to standards. So. Along the left-hand side, you'll see those criteria, which you know, basically um, was the lens that we used to decide that actively learn was what we wanted to bring forth to you for adoption and approval. So this includes you know, what kinds of uh, resources and lessons are there? Are they aligned with our standards and our performance expectations? So our common core state standards, our Washington state standards, that's, also, that's always a big uh, uh, a criteria or piece to look at. On the right-hand side, you'll see if you go into the platform, it gives you a bit of a tutorial how to find where you would f see these uh, criteria come to life. So um, you, can, you can search, in this example, you can find content by standard. So if you're looking at a particular writing standard, I can type that into the platform and it'll bring up content, it'll bring up lessons, it'll bring up units aligned to those uh, performance expectations. That's basically how the document is laid out. The criteria on the left, which includes um, learning progressions that are outlined by our state standards. How, how does that come to play in this content platform? Um, tasks, it's important that uh, the tasks we ask our kids to engage with actually exist in the real world. So an example of that would be, how are we teaching our kids to, um, uh, how are we teaching argumentative writing as an example? So in terms of academic discourse, how can they, engage in literary text or nonfiction texts, learn about different perspectives, formulate their own, their own argument, use textual evidence. All of those pieces are embedded within the content in this, in this platform. And there's some instructions there about how to find some of those things. We're always thinking about all of our learners in terms of scaffolding tools. So one of the, one of the positives of this platform is that it provides a bevy of tools in terms of vocabulary, text-to-speech, it has over 100 languages trans that translate all the different texts. It has um, annotation tools. Teachers can insert questions into text or even upload their own text. It's very, uh, as I said, modular and flexible and keeps a lot of the instructional power in the hands of the teachers, but also they don't have to spend as much time searching for content. The content is right there for them. There's a, a section that would guide you to see some of the tools that teachers would use around differentiation. Um, it's important that all of our kids have access to core instruction. So when we think about kids who maybe need more support, who aren't quite at grade level, 
Uh, we don't want to just um, water down our instruction to a lower level, but we want to increase the scaffolds that we use so that they can access grade level content and standards. And so this, is, this tool provides those powerful tools. And there's some examples of how, of how it does that in this document for you to kind of go in and look at. We know that we have a large population of English learners and we are striving to meet their needs in Evergreen Public Schools. And so this was a big part of our review and adoption process with our teachers. Does this, are the tools and the resources we're using, do they provide for our English language learners? And as I mentioned, there's a variety of tools here that do that, including text-to-speech, uh, dictionary tools. Um, there are translations, as I said, into over 100 different languages. And the top 10 translations, top 10 languages have, have a real authentic, non-robotic, let's say, uh, text-to-speech application. So kids actually hear voices and intonation as the text is being read to them. So basically, I won't belabor the point, but there are a variety of extension lessons, customization options. Teachers are real excited about how a kid can go and do research and bring that research, any of the articles that they're researching that are curated for them, they can bring it into Actively Learn, and the teacher can go through and see what each kid is doing. Because one of the things I hear from high school English teachers is want to make sure that you know, they're out there encountering uh, good, you know, powerful sources, sources that actually um, are maybe non-biased, or if there is bias, they recognize that. So this platform actually allows the teacher to see what each student is researching within the platform itself, as opposed to just they're out on the internet somewhere and we don't know what they're doing. And there's a few other criteria here um, in terms of assessment. They're a powerful assessment tool. So, it's really a robust platform, and I think, you know, as we were going through the review process and just looking at usage data between our current adopted resource, there were probably 60 to 70% of our high school English teachers were using this as a supplemental, which we brought into uh, our, our ecosystem about four years ago, as opposed to about 10% of our teachers using the adopted resource, which, as I mentioned before, was just kind of this uh, reincarnation of a big box publisher textbook online. So I think it's really critical that our teachers have um, access to tools and resources that provide flexibility, yet still adhere to those critical performance expectations that we, we know our kids, um, and the standards we know our kids need to learn as they move through our system. Um, I think that's about it. I, this link, again, was the first link on that one pager that you have access to. The second link is just a general tutorial. Actively Learn does provide some science and social studies content, which would be a separate thing. It's not part of our proposed adoption, but it has a pretty robust um, collection of science and social studies resources, too, that if you know Ryan Theodore Riches, he was pretty excited about that, too. But um, we're speaking primarily of English. Um, the other last piece that I wanted to mention is the cost of this is roughly half of what we're uh, currently paying for our adopted resource. And one of the things I've been talking with our high school folks about is we don't want our kids to just exist in a digital ecosystem. That's where we're going, obviously, in our world today. But the use of actual physical texts is really still important. So what I'd like to do, budget pending, is use some of the money we may save in moving to this platform to work with a committee of teachers and stakeholders around bringing in um, other diverse, inclusive texts in physical form so we could, we could have hybrid classrooms where there might be a, a classroom library of contemporary um, young, young adult fiction that kids could access and hold on to and not just look at a screen. I think the cost savings would um, allow for that, for that option to be kind of examined. So. How, how does this integrate with the um, elementary adoption that we have for Reading the, um, and Penel. The, the Fountains and Pinnell classroom. Well, it on the surface it looks pretty different, but when you look at it, when you look at our progression of standards from K through 12, all of the adoption that we have, both the FPC adoption at elementary, our current um, adoption at middle school, which we just had a couple years ago via Zoom, our units of study uh, with Lucy Calkins, they're all built on the backbone of Common Core standards. So when kids are in high school, I think it's, it's, it's important for all of our kids to have choice in terms of what they read and what their experiences are. But 
at the high school level, I think we also start to really z zero in on informational text, research-based writing, and so this is a resource that um, I think provides for that higher percentage of experiences in that realm as they prepare for graduation. Um, in terms of instructional practices, there should be some alignment in terms of the way that teachers are modeling for kids, the way that there should be interactive read-alouds, there should be conferring practices and small group instruction happening, and this kind of platform allows for, for that to happen either in a digital or in-person environment. So kids can actually talk to each other on this platform and review each other's work and communicate and annotate each other's work. Um, so it's just kind of a more advanced, I would say, uh, application of some of those same instructional practices. Yeah. Could you remind us the name of the adopted curriculum right now? I'm sorry? What, what was the adopted uh, curriculum the, called? The, the current adopted curriculum is My Perspectives. It's a Pearson, which I think was renamed Savas product. So Pearson is obviously one of the big publishers that we have worked with over the years, but... We'd be discontinuing the use of My Perspectives in favor of this? Yes. Does it work with Canvas? Yes, full integration. Nice. Any other questions? I don't have a question, but I would, um, is it possible for you to resend us this document? Not all the links at the top of yours are on ours. Oh, okay. Yes, for sure. I, I can send that to Lori. Thank you. Mm -hmm. I did have a question too, as far as the committee makeup. Do we have any p parents on that committee at this time? I know with COVID and everything that kind of got. Yeah, that was a little challenging. No, we had, we had two kind of separate committees. The review committee was high school English teachers, and then per board policy for the adoption committee, several of those teachers um, moved on to that committee, but we also added a high school administrator for that. Um, but we did not have parents involved in either of those. <coughs> so we want to try and help with that. We uh, get more parents. I know Rob yeah, used I to be on it. Was on it. He was um, on the board. Michael Parsons was on it before he came onto the board as well. Well, and this is, if you're speaking of the Instructional Materials Committee, that's, that was separate. But I know there, there may have been two open spots there. But there are spots on the IMC for community members. Yeah. So do we need to... Uh, we need to advertise. Yeah, and ask for people to join, is that... No. Yeah, I think that was an ask that went out a few weeks ago because seeing those vacancies was, you know, we want our community involved. Mm -hmm. Certainly. Yes, we do. Anything else? Well, thanks for your time. Thanks I appreciate so it. Thank you very much. I look forward to reading them, reading into it. Good evening. My name is Marlena Sears Gudgel, and I am an elementary math TOSA on the um, curriculum and instruction team. Uh, I'm really excited to be here tonight to talk to you guys about our elementary core mathematics adoption and the journey we've taken this year um, for piloting um, curriculum. So why, why adopt? With our continued and growing focus on equity, we needed to find a curriculum that would ensure not just equity and implementation and use across our system, K-5, in all classrooms, but also equity in the student experience in the classroom. A curriculum that goes deep with mathematics, leverages multiple mathematical competencies, affirms our learners' identities and challenges spaces of marginality while drawing on multiple resources of knowledge. The curriculum also needed to be coherent, rigorous, usable and have a foundation of culturally responsive pedagogy and address language learning in the context of mathematical learning. The curriculum needed to not only meet our rigorous common core standards in both coherence and focus, but also needed to be properly translated into Spanish. With our focus on culturally responsive teaching and equitable teaching practice, we looked for curricula that had these practices embedded and were designed with this in mind. Finally, we needed it to be usable for our teachers with both print, digital, and hands-on materials provided. 
We were also moved by our data to improve the core math experience for our students. As you can see, the majority of our students in every grade level are one or more years behind as of this last iReady data. Uh, when disaggregated by race, the data shows disproportionate achievement of grade level expectations. This also applies to our students on IEPs with disabilities, English language learners, and our Latinx population. We believe this data reflects, again, those needs with regard to equity, culturally responsive pedagogy, and addressing language learning within the math curriculum. So for these reasons, we narrowed our um, focus to two curriculum, San Francisco Unified and Illustrative Mathematics. Both are problem-based, which addresses the shifts of the Common Core State Standards and provides a more equitable math experience for our learners. Both have teams of writers that specialize in pedagogy, content, language learning, universal design for learning, and culturally responsive teaching. Both were translated into Spanish and both have digital components. We used the Ed Reports process for piloting and decided to pilot one unit from each curriculum for the sake of teacher capacity this year. It's also a recommended method from Ed Reports. Illustrative math was piloted at Harmony, Sifton, Pioneer in both English and Spanish, and Columbia Valley, and San Francisco Unified was piloted at Illahi, Pioneer, both English and Spanish, and at Sunset. It has been, um, or sorry, teachers in building leadership participated in curriculum training, and teams participated in unit planning, and we also had um, the opportunity to visit sites and see it in action, so I just wanted, I captured a couple videos and hopefully it's not too loud. But this is in a first grade classroom. They have like a, a closet like this. They have a one of a closet like this. I think it's, they have like a small little closet. So let's put them there. Okay. Oh, can you guys show me how you made your circle? So, so, Let's all put our parts together. So we show, we do it like this. No, mm -hmm. but when, when Jaden, so so we were like this. We can't do it then because Jaden, Jaden, we were, we didn't have it. Oh. Jaden, Jaden. Jaden. Oh. We made a circle. Oh. You made a circle. Yeah. How would you guys we do that? That's just one small example of was able to capture it on video, <laughs> just the excitement of, about math. So um, we established a pilot team um, earlier in the fall and sought to collaborate across our departments um, here at the district to ensure expertise from all areas was heard and considered. We spent time learning about this piloting process and then did deep studies of both curricula, bringing each member's expertise into the process. So you can see our team had representation from teachers and coaches, um, our math specialists and intervention specialists, our dual language and language specialists, our equity advancement specialists. Um, so yeah, lots of representation and really wanted it to be a united front and choice so that we can you know, have, have the best um, intent going forward. We used um, the Ed, Re Ed Reports evaluation rubric that has three major gateways with components and criteria under each. So coherence and focus, rigor and practice, and usability. Then we created um, an indicators of equity uh, gateway based on the National Council for Teachers of Mathematics Equitable Teaching Practices and guidance from their book, Rehumanizing Mathematics for Black, Indigenous, and Latinx Students. Each member of the pilot committee scored the rubric, rubric with their expert lens after studying the curriculum. Teachers scored the rubric in the category of usability. Teachers also gave anecdotal feedback daily via a Google form with their thoughts and about the strengths and challenges of the curriculum and the student experience. The pilot committee then uh, used this data and we did a um, data analysis protocol to observe and then interpret and then make a decision based on the data. We used raw data to unpack scores given 
and found that illustrative math outperformed San Francisco in every category. And we came to the unanimous decision that the adopted curriculum would be illustrative math based on this data. And then going back to those four reasons for the why behind the adoption, so equity. IM's um, problem-based curriculum addresses the need for going beyond procedure and memorization and into deep meaning making with tasks that have high cognitive demand and multiple solution strategies and representations. It leverages multiple mathematical competencies through invitational tasks that offer multiple entry points. It challenges spaces of marginality by positioning students as sources of expertise, centers their experiences and knowledge, and encourages student-to-student -student interaction and participation. Illustrative math uses culturally diverse contexts to provide students both windows and mirrors, and uses previous mathematics knowledge to connect to new learning. I am also supports teachers in providing accessible instruction for students with disabilities and prompts them to consider both the strengths and the needs of their particular students. The materials provide alternative means of engagement, representation, and action and expression in order to position all learners as competent and valued contributors. For language, IM's design principles promote mathematical language use and development to support sense making, optimizing output, cultivating conversation, and maximizing meta-awareness. The math language routines were developed by Stanford's Graduate School of Education and are embedded throughout the lessons. For, for coherence and rigor, IM scored the highest in that category on the Ed Reports rubric. And in addition, IM is already our adopted middle school and high school math curriculum. And this will create a system of coherence with pedagogy, philosophy, routines, structures, models, and language across our K-12 system. And then finally, usability. With IM, teachers will have access to a completely new digital platform with the ability to assign, assess, differentiate, and intervene digitally. But also, teachers will have print copies of their teacher editions for each unit, student journals, manipulatives, and centers, all prepped and ready. This will save teachers time with prep and allow them to focus on student needs and planning. So illustrative math will provide a rich foundation of mathematical content, support our teachers in content knowledge and skill, and also change the role of the student, supporting our work towards rehumanizing the math classroom. We, we know, though, that in order for that to happen, our implementation must be strong. So we have a plan in place for all structures in our system, from PD with our instructional coaches starting this spring, labs with our language specialists in May, PD for teachers in August, and district-wide unit planning across the school year to introduce teachers to each unit and collaboratively do the math and plan together for their learners. We also have created an instructional integrity data monitoring tool to help our building and district leaders with implementation goals and progress. And we're excited and ready to begin this journey for our students and teachers. And I wanted to share, just this slide has our theory of change that um, we created before we started the pilot of, um, to address the need, again, to rehumanize our math classrooms. And we know that curriculum is just one part. Curriculum is so important, but we also need to make sure that we are attending to teacher PD and teacher practice and also the role of the student in the math classroom and how that's shifted with our Common Core um, standards. And so that's our theory. I won't read it to you, but um, that was kind of our theory of change um, with our pilot process. Um, and any questions? And thank you so much for listening. <coughs> I also include, I don't know if you guys have, in that one pager, there is a link to this slide deck. And so there's lots of links within here on this page that you can explore. There's webinars, there's links to the, um, to the platform, links to what the student workbooks and teacher guides look like, and all of the good stuff. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. I, I could ask, uh, first of all, same as before, does it work with Canvas? Um, yes, yes, full, mm -hmm. and, and it's elementary, so mm -hmm. I know we, that yeah. or CSA? Michelle and I, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Michelle's had a few meetings already with our rep. I, you answered the, uh, the initial question that I have is that I remembered that illustrative math, il illustrative math? Yeah, illustrative. Illustrative <laughs> math was the, uh, uh, was the middle school adoption. Mm -hmm. um, 
And I'm afraid the question left my head. <laughs> and high school too, so we have it for algebra, geometry, and algebra So two. we're talking about a K through 12 kind of curriculum alignment. Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, yeah, very, very nice. Please go ahead. I'll remember it in a minute. <laughs> Other questions? I guess I, <clears throat> what's exciting to me as I've looked at different math curriculums over the years is this feels like something kids can really get into. You know, I mean, I'm old, so, you know, in math, when I was learning math and stuff, it was not fun. It wasn't interesting to me. And what I like about the sound of this is how it engages the student into what math can really bring to our lives, how they can use it in their, in everything that they do, that it does matter. Yeah. And I, cause we, you know, over the years you hear a lot of kids saying, why do I, I mean, I'll never use this again. Well, that's not true, but they don't realize it till it's right. too late sometimes. So engaging them into something that can show them a purpose for the learning and how they can use it in real time, I think is really exciting to me. Yes, I, um, the curriculum is designed, basically um, the beginning of every unit is very invitational, the beginning of every lesson is invitational, and the year at a glance is the beginning of the year is invitational, and then deepens the learning over the lesson, over the unit, over the year, and then always is kind of coming together with what did we learn today and like um, zipping up that backpack of learning um, to move forward to the next day. So really kids can bring their own knowledge, but they're gonna learn that the, the learning happens not basically everybody sits and <laughs> listens to the teacher, but I mean, everyone listens to the teacher, of course, but um, it's not the teacher up teaching, it's the kids experiencing and learning together and the teacher's there to guide them and, and um, and that consolidation at the end. So just the structure of it is very invitational, but then it gets very deep in the learning and um, yeah, it's really exciting to see. I remember now. <laughs> it, was, um, it was about uh, sort of the, the beginning introductions that are possible in elementary school with the computer sciences. Is there a way for this uh, curriculum to introduce a child as young as eight years old to the idea of coding? Ooh. That's a great question. Um, I'd have to, Michelle would be a good person to ask about that too. I'll have to find out from her. Cause I really focus on like the math content standards. So I haven't really looked into like the digital, but there's so much opportunity as far as this digital platform for engagement, um, more than I think our teachers have been able to have access to before. So I can't imagine it being a detriment or being you know less than. But that's definitely something I would have to look into. It used to be that when we were in school, we learned an algorithm to do arithmetic. That was elementary school. And now uh, the basic life and career meet needs is you need to learn how to make the algorithm. Mm -hmm. uh, you need to learn how to like intuit how, why carry the one works and, and so forth in those basic mm -hmm. standard algorithms. And um, it's just, I guess I'm being a little evocative here. Uh, really important that kids learn how to code. And uh, if, this, if this fosters that, then, then that's pretty exciting. Thank you. Thanks. Yes, thank you very much for that presentation. It's exciting when we uh, get to look at new curriculum. <laughs> yes. Thank you so much. Well, and the need is there. I mean, let's face it. I mean, the data shows and the most challenging part I think that that's always concerning to me because we know that we look at our data for kids that have been in our system their whole career they do exceptionally well and because we're such a highly mobile community with kids coming in and out and in and out um, we need to bridge that um, gap that when we receive kids, because we got to take them where they are and move them forward, is um, I'm hoping that this curriculum and the other one that we saw ignites, ignites something in these kids that can propel them forward so that we don't have that gap um, and maybe 
you know, hopefully, as we keep trying to work on having people be, you know, stay. But we know, especially with our kids in poverty, that's challenging. So. Thank you very much. Uh, next on our agenda is the legislative update. Director Perkins. Coming at this a little late, but I just plugged in the computer and if you're able to put it on the screen, we can see the bill watch list that we've been following for the legislative session. <clears throat> Ooh, and how do I make it bigger? How's that? Uh, to show the bills, uh, sort of uh, organized by <clears throat> the broad categories that the WASA, WASDA, WASBO um, coalition put together, uh, to show that there are um, at least four passages uh, for improved health and safety for students and staff. Um, Some bills here that are necessary to uh, implement the budget haven't gone past their third reading, haven't gone to the floor yet. Um, 1664 and 1590 about prototypical school models to support you know, that one year turmoil of enrollment loss. Well, we figure out how to readjust, readjust to lower enrollment or better determine all of that. Uh, but those, are, those bills are making progress State Board of Education is extending, uh, if the governor signs it, is extending voting authority to its student members. And uh, if you'll recall um, from one of the good news reports, uh, one of our students has been on the State Board of Education as a student member, Ashley Lynn, I think of Union High School. Um, so this impacts us kind of directly because there are a lot of students who can take an interest in that. And, um, but other than that, it's, it's just to say that I think the, uh, the problems that might have arisen from legislation that would have been detrimental to kids appear to have died in committee um, or been corrected uh, so that uh, it's something that we can uh, come into agreement on. Uh, and it doesn't look at this point like there is anything harmful in the legislation that passes with respect to you know, our budget priorities and uh, our student learning priorities. Um, and it doesn't seem like there are all that many new mandates. So this is, a, this is a pretty good outcome. I invite you to take a look at the watch list uh, and tell me, if we still have a week to go, I think, a few days, where the budget will be approved. And if there's advocacy to do, uh, please let me know. Uh, and we'll work on that. But uh, other than that, it's nice to it's nice to get a pretty good outcome. And there are a couple of new grants that uh, you might want to look into for different programs. Um, maybe we could just talk over lunch sometime about the details. Uh, and yeah, good short session. Legislators. The so busy. The insurance risk one. The insurance the risk one was corrected on the floor. Um, to include the exception for public agencies. As far as I know, John, do you have any other information? Oh, you, you nailed it, Rob. Just those two bills that you highlighted, the enrollment stabilization and the prototypical model have the potential to help us pretty significantly. So yeah. thanks, for, you really did a nice job of laying this out and thank you for your advocacy. That is all. Thanks, Rob. <coughs> All right, Ginny stepped out for just a second. Um, I think that's the end of our board workshop, correct? All right, you wanna adjourn the meeting, Ginny? <laughs> <laughs> just in time. Sure. All right, it's 7.30, we're gonna go ahead and, 7.35, we're gonna go ahead and adjourn the meeting tonight. Thank you, everyone.